Roll call, please. Finance New Orleans Programs Committee meeting roll call. Chair Andronica Morris. Present. Mrs. Giselle Johnson Banks. Present. Mr. Steve Smith. A quorum is present. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. We've got, uh, um, and we're broadcasting live on YouTube, great. Uh, we've got a lot going on today. Uh, so we have uh, old business up for discussion. Uh, Damon, I see we've got some conversation to talk about, or, um, and the SAC approval is up for Christopher Park, but we've also got some um, uh, some information to hear from uh, Mykeisha, Mykeisha, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Damon, and, and you can have the staff take, it, take them through it. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> uh, as it relates to uh, Christopher Park, we actually have uh, some other issues going on with the project that have um, you know, uh, warranted our attention. So it, it, there's still some funding uh, requirements that need to be met for the project. We're at the, uh, the finish line, but you know, a few more hurdles need to be crossed before we can officially close out the project. So we have been working with Hanno and the development team in order to uh, address the issues that have been presented, you know, mainly as a result of the shifts, the shifts that we're going in, going through around the world. There's a war happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates are, uh, you know, they were, they we're going up, not going down, and you know, who knows where they'll go next. So there's just a lot happening that have affected our local projects on the ground. Uh, but the SAC approval is uh, we're still pending the final result or the final answer that we're seeking, but we're also addressing some of those other issues as well. So we'll continue to update the board. Okay, uh, yeah. Start. And let's talk about some of those at the next meeting uh, so we can hear what some of the challenges are. Um, I suspect there's things like insurance yes. uh, and, and other issues that we do need to be talking about because they, they, they have impact. And um, there's a, this also must be something that we can bring to the larger board and, and talk to the team about because uh, the legislative session is, is, has gaveled in. Um, there's an attempt to talk about some reform at the legislature around insurance. And uh, that's definitely something that we need to be looking at because if deals that um, were ready to rock and roll 90 days ago are now being imperiled um, and we don't, and the fact of the matter is, is the insurance issues are just beginning because they're not, um, they're not, it's not about the, the, the war. It's not about gas prices. It's not about inflation. It's about the market rebalancing itself, recalibrating itself after COVID. And we haven't had the recalibration after uh, three hurricanes in South Louisiana over the last year. So there's going to be another recalibration of the insurance market. The fact that we're losing population, um, there's less people to spread the risk around to. That so we, we need to talk about that. So yeah, let's um, let's get into it. Um, so um, we have a um, go ahead, uh, um, Damon. Yeah, no problem. We'll so we'll again continue to update you as well as keep an eye on what's going on with some of the other projects. I uh, had a chance to go to a, a groundbreaking today. Yes, that's that right. We, yeah, H3C, they had a groundbreaking and, uh, you know, a lot of good people from the community out and everybody was excited to see such a big project get done and so many community pieces coming together. So that's a good sign. That's something for us to build on. Uh, but we are, we are going to have to address many of the issues related to construction costs, insurance, as you just laid out. Um, so we will, we'll, we'll, we will keep this top of mind and uh, keep coming back to the board. Yeah. So the next thing we'd like to do today is talk about the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan and our intentions to launch an innovation fund. We've been talking about it for a few years now, but we, we've finally turned the corner and are ready to transition our former Pathways to Home Ownership Fund into an innovation fund. And the idea there is simple. We need more sustainable housing. We need to address <clears throat> or entertain more innovative ideas as it relates to reviving our neighborhoods, making them more resilient, making them more green. 
So there's seed capital, there's an upfront investment that needs to be made in that type of activity, uh, either, either through pre-development funding or equity funding uh, for small businesses and startups. There's a variety of ways that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, impact that particular space. But also the larger plan is to, is to have a, a, a full scale infrastructure program that finances green buildings, that finances renewable energy projects, stormwater management, nature-based solutions, et cetera. Uh, so we've been working on uh, a map of what that looks like for us. How does it connect to our vision? How does it connect to the vision of the city and the other agencies? Uh, so today, Mashika Batiste, our Director of Innovation, will present to you the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan, which we approved last year. But we'll give you a refresher and we'll talk about how this spins off into our innovation fund and what the strategy for the innovation fund uh, is moving forward. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mashika and uh, take it away. Good afternoon. Um, Naj, are you controlling the screen? Would you like me to let you control your screen? That's fine. Okay, great. No problem. Okay. You got it. Do you have the presentation up where I can move it or do you want me to share the screen? I already had it up. Okay. Do you want me to present it or do you want to present it? That's easier. That's fine. I was, I was. Okay. There it is. So as Damon mentioned, um, the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan was approved last year. And we have been working with our partners um, in the working group um, with the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan to put a pipeline of projects together. But we really wanna to talk today about what does that pipeline look like and then how do we move forward with our Resilient New Orleans Innovation Fund. Um, if you can scroll up, please, Naj. So just as a refresher, the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan, and that's our framework to coordinate the mobilization of public and private sector capital for projects that we feel are going to physically transform um, the city through climate resilience and social impactfulness. There's different sectors to this plan. Um, next slide, please. Um, that frame this plan. And so if you see there's climate action, sustainability, green economic development, and social equity. We are looking at projects that um, target renewable energy, green buildings, clean transportation, water management, and nature-based solutions are the type of projects in the sectors that we're looking at. Um, and these fall into our, that will fall into our bond issue categories. Um, next slide. But I really wanna start with explaining what these projects look like and exactly what are climate projects. Um, if you can go into the next slide, Naj. So climate projects are characterized in two different ways. Um, and we'll start with the first one, which is mitigation. And this is the, reduction of GHG emissions or the sequestration of them. And if you see the emission profile and inventory of the city of New Orleans, there are three major categories, um, the energy, transportation, and waste that make up our GHG um, emission profiles. So when we're talking about um, making a con contribution and supporting the city of New Orleans through mitigation, we're talking about replacement of fossil fuels for renewable and clean energy, um, through solar thermal, um, photovoltaic installations, um, wind energy installations, promoting clean transportation, such as supporting infrastructure for electric public transit, zero emission vehicles, cycling and walking infrastructure, as well as reduction of waste generation and increasing recycling. 
So the other approach, if we're talking about the reduction of GHG emissions and that focusing on climate change, the next approach would be the consequences of climate change. And that would mean that we would have to look at adaptation. So if you would go to the next slide, please. So the main focus of adaptation is to um, reduce climate impacts and the consequences of those. So those impacts are such things as heat, heat waves, flooding, hurricanes, um, sea level rise, um, and those solutions that we can support the city with are nature-based solutions, such as initiatives and strategies that help promote and restore um, biological diversity through uh, green rooftops, parks, green spaces, um, the implementation of flood risk mitigation initiatives. Um, and we've talked about these in the past, permeable pavers, rain barrels, French drains and rain gardens, as well as hurricane proofing homes and infrastructure. Um, we can use both mitigation and adaptation when we're looking at solutions. And this picture here is actually from the Climate Action Plan from Houston. And as if you see, they both have mitigation and adaptation strategies in their Climate Action Plan. And those are the type of projects that we're also looking um, to map and also um, help um, get those off the ground. Um, so. If you can see here, you have your energy efficiency, you have um, more green spaces, you have um, electric vehicles, you have energy efficiency. So all of them work hand in hand, and those are the projects that we are looking for um, when we're talking about mitigation and adapt adaptation. Next slide, please. So this right here is actually called the 15 minute city. Um, when we're looking at this, this is actually a map of the climate plan for Paris and also other cities such as Milan and Melbourne have used um, similar plans um, because it brings these projects coming together brings co-benefits to the city. So what the 15 minute plan is um, within 15 uh, minute radius, all things that you can do in your should you should be able to do in your neighborhood. So whether it's going to the doctor or going to the pharmacy, eating, you should be able to do that within walking or biking um, in a 15 minute radius. Um, this helps with the reduction of the CO2 emissions, improved air quality. It's a better quality of life for citizens. Um, here, Paris has where they've already um, eliminated 60,000 street parking um, spaces because they wanted more green space um, and planting of trees. Uh, and also, it also helps with the um, when they are doing adaptable and resilient buildings. Um, those buildings are also being used for various things, such as if your if your doctor's office closes at five o'clock, they're used for different activities in the evening and also on the weekend. So they're using them as co spaces as well. Um, these benefits also create green jobs and actually it's a better ecosystem for urban spaces. Um, these type of cities has actually won um, climate change awards and we are looking to fund projects that um, are very similar in nature um, and bringing New Orleans into a more green and uh, more uh, in, to reduce our CO, CO2 emissions in the air. Um, so that's those are the type of climate projects when we're talking about um, climate mitigation and adaptation that we're looking at. Next slide, please. So why is it important for us to map these projects? Um, Naj, you can go to the next slide. Well, we want everyone to understand what qualifies as a green project. Not everybody understands what that is. And then also that those projects um, contribute positively to the environmental objectives. This helps um, investors, banks to identify where our green assets are, and then also to help support our market efficiency for directing capital flows um, and investment opportunities. Next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> 
So the pipeline for bankable and investable green projects, um, we know here in the city can, has not met the demand of investors. Investors are looking for these projects and we're here to help create that pipeline so that they will have, so that we will have a more bankable um, pipeline for investors and banks. Um, we have an approach of how we are assisting um, our partners in developing the projects so that they are profitable and deliver um, the, the outcomes and the measures that we've um, put in the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan. Next slide, please. So here's the approach that we're taking, and the starting point for the implementation of the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan um, is the identification of the emission sources and sectors. Um, this allows for us to see where vulnerable assets and the sectors that are critical to effective mitigation um, so that we can have our um, adaptation strategies. Then we have the project concept development um, and strategic actions. This guides us in terms of project identification, um, selection, and how we prioritize those projects. Um, this actually um, uses, is gonna have extensive internal and external stakeholder engagement. Um, it's important that our partners um, come to us in the early stage so that we are able to help them um, avoid any common green financing barriers. Um, and then also um, with the pre-feasibility and feasibility studies um, that are gonna be conducted on those projects. Then we have the business and financial development model. Um, this is just the conceptual framework um, of the project, and this allows for us to understand what the value and the profitability of that project will be. Then we have the feasibility and implementation and the measurement of impact against targets, which is really important um, because this allows us to go back and look if these projects um, are actually hitting the targets that have been put in place um, to, um, um, to hit the goals that we've all been um, in the targets that we have in the uh, Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan and then also the targets for the city. Next slide, please. So what does our current pipeline look like? Um, next slide, please. So um, Finance New Orleans and C40 have been working with our partner agencies to develop this process um, to understand where green project, what green projects are happening in the city could possibly happen. Um, we wanna know what the scope of work is, um, what the climate benefits are, what that stage is. If there are any barriers, we know barriers happen. If there's any expected barriers or any that could possibly come up. And then what are the next steps in the project? So um, we sent out a survey after we um, met with our working group and we, we meet, um, we try to meet once a quarter. Our next one will be in May. But um, the survey did come back with these particular projects. And there's a couple that I'll speak um, to. But these are the projects that we are looking at and we are currently working on. So one of them is with the city, um, solar rooftops. There are seven buildings that have been identified um, that meet all the requirements, which are quite a few for solar rooftops. Um, and we are working to get those um, off the ground with their offices and also with Posigen. We're also looking to do community solar. Community solar, we haven't really done that in the city. Um, there hasn't been any community solar, but we're looking to get that off the ground. We're working in conjunction with, at the same time, with the solar rooftops. And that community solar will allow for people who don't necessarily own homes um, to be able to tap into the benefits in, of, of solar. Um, and then a project that I'll talk a little bit more in detail about and then some of the other work that we're doing with the RTA is the Downtown Regional Transit Center. Um, and Najah, if you could go to the next slide. So this is a $24 million project that they, um, they submitted a grant for in November um, and we uh, submitted LOI. Um, to, to help with that grant. And this is for us to say that we will work with RTA to fund resilient elements of this transit facility and others both existing um, and plan. And it's um, intended to help um, supplement any other um, 
traditional financing sources or grants. Um, and we have not heard, well, I haven't heard that from that. We have talked, but I know um, my contact there, they did receive the RAISE grant and that grant allows, um, will allow for us to help with them with other RTA regional um, transfer hubs and transfer points. Um, it looks like two to three now and possibly more. So working with our partner agencies allows for us to understand what those projects are and then how we can um, help finance those resilient or green elements of their project to get those off the ground. Um, because of the RAISE grant and because of the other projects, we are um, currently working on a CEA with RTA um, for future projects um, that are coming down the pipeline. Now you can go to the next slide. You can go to the next one. Um, so this is our resilient innovation fund, and you will be hearing a lot about this in the in the upcoming meetings. But I will um, start talking about it today. Um, we're looking to do a revolving loan fund that provides seed funding and pre-development loans for projects. Um, companies, um, institutions that fit into the sectors um, that we've talked about in the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan. Um, these pre-development loans help support local companies um, with technical assistance in order for those projects to be jump-started. Um, we know that talking with these particular um, founders of these companies, that they really um, need help with such things as engineering, market assessments, economic feasibility studies, um, risk assessments, permitting, um, business plan writing, all of those things to get them off the ground. Um, so this fund aims to support those projects um, so that they can get off the ground. Um, and then they also would support the outcomes and themes that we talked about earlier from the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan, which is climate action, green economic development, sustainability, social equity, and economic justice. Um, as well as enable these companies to develop innovative projects that meets the needs of the communities. We have um, been working with several companies, just having conversations with them. There's so many innovative um, projects that are out there, and we know that um, not all of them will fit our criteria, but we know that there are some out there. Um, we have possibly about a seven in our pipeline that um, we are we are working with and talking to. Um, and so it's very exciting, all of the different um, innovative initiatives that are out there and projects, but how do we help them get off the ground? Um, next slide, please, Naj. So as Damon um, brought up earlier in um, we will have more extensive conversations about this and bring this in front of the board um, and the program committee um, is um, the Pathways Fund. There is about $2.2 million in assets in that fund, and we're looking to capitalize this innovation fund with those assets. Um, again, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work that's been um, to, to get this fund to the stage that it's in for us to present to you. Um, so we wanted to present everything um, once it's finalized um, so that you can have a clear picture of what it is that this fund looks like and all of the, the legalities, all the paperwork, all those things that, that go with it. Um, so as I mentioned before, you will be seeing and hearing a lot about this and um, all of the upcoming um, committee meetings and then the board. Um, so it provides that pre-development capital seed funding, potentially equity guarantees and partnering um, on equity projects with developers. Um, the goal of this fund um, is to keep pace with green innovation and create new project products. We know that you know um, other cities are doing this and it's working. Um, we have um, analysis and we have data that shows that helping with these, um, having this fund and helping with green innovation, um, it comes back um, twofold, back to the city. Um, job creation, it stimulates the economy. Um, we're investing in startups um, and it helps meet the climate goals that we that we know have been set for. 
as well as it trains new business leaders and creates a new um, talent pool here in the city. So as I said, more information to come on that. Um, but that is what we're looking for on the innovation fund that works all with the Resilient New Orleans Finance Plan. Um, so that's the work we've been doing over the last few months with, on infrastructure with our working group and also with the building of this innovation fund. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mashika, for the information. Um, it, it, just to reiterate some of the things that Mashika went over, we think we, this is important for us to do because just in short, these projects won't come from, come from out of nowhere. We have to stimulate it. We have to cultivate the ideas that are out there. And many of the local companies that are trying to get these ideas off the ground, they need connections to the agencies that are a part of the Resilient New Orleans plan. They need assistance to understand how do you do an institutional size project with a governmental agency like a finance New Orleans or an RTA or the city of New Orleans. So there's just a lot of cultivation of the ideas that will eventually blossom into our vision, the city's vision for a more resilient New Orleans. Our green bank counterparts around the, the country are doing just this. They're making pre-development investments and seed investments and innovative ideas, green building projects, housing sustainability projects, there's a variety of projects that we can fund through this type of uh, fund or this, this segregated type of fund at Finance New Orleans. Um, so we feel it's an important part of the long-term vision, although it's the, the smaller side of our uh, revenue model or business model, uh, we think it, it's the side that's gonna create the most impact. And ultimately what we'd like to see happen is all of those projects in the pipeline that Mashika went over those projects will ultimately result, result in um, bond deals. They will, they will result in pilot arrangements. They will result in green bond issuances because these projects ultimately will need long-term financing to get across the finish line. So this innovation fund is meant to jumpstart these projects, which will eventually, uh, as we designed it, they should flow back through our system uh, as some other type of financing. Um, so again, this is this is critical to the vision that we've set for the city, um, and we really would uh, appreciate any questions, any feedback that would help us make this better. We'd like to start rolling this out to the community um, and closing on those first few projects in the pipeline that we have. So I'll stop there and we can take any questions from the board. Okay, well, thank you. We'll be back with more information and we can move on with the agenda. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the new business. Uh, we want to go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the last two meetings. So moved. All right, motion moved. Um, the motion is properly moved. Uh, can I call for a vote? Everybody in favor, say aye. Aye. <laughs> all right, motion carries the minutes from both previous meet from all, um, all outstanding meetings have been approved. Uh, we are moving, now getting, continuing with new business. We need to go ahead and let's start with the we want to hear the active sustainable developer pipeline, and then that's going to lead us into the presentations. Is that how you got this set up, Damon? Yes, I'll go through the program's report briefly, and then we can jump into the presentations. Thank you, Nash. So in terms of activity for this month, uh, there isn't much change from the previous months. Uh, as you know, we've... Uh, we've reached the end of our allocation uh, in the community support fund uh, for housing payments or for housing assistance. And we've allocated the rest towards utility assistance, uh, but we don't have any, uh, any activity of note. 
So what we're doing as a staff internally is figuring out ways to uh, get that money out into the community and connect it to the Green Mortgage Program, which had one closing in February. We're preparing to uh, put some marketing muscle behind our Green Mortgage Program. We've yet to fully announce it to the community. We've been in the background making sure that the infrastructure works, making sure that our financial partnerships are in place so that we can have a functional program that can scale. We think we're ready to scale this now. So you're going to start hearing more information from us about the Green Mortgage Program. We're going to be promoting it to the community, radio, TV, social media. We're going to get creative, pounding the pavement, going, sitting with people face to face, doing seminars. There's a variety of things that we plan to do in order to get the message out about the Green Mortgage Program. As it relates to the, to the Sustainable Developer Program, uh, there are 53 total projects that we've been looking at, 17 active in the pipeline. H3C closed uh, in 2021. I mentioned earlier that I was able to go to the groundbreaking for that project today. So that was an amazing, good, great to see the energy out there. Everybody was excited about the potential impacts of that project. Um, so, you know, a lot of conversations were had about doing this multiple times a year. Um, so it's not all about the ceremonies and the groundbreakings, but it is a good time for us to take a step back and look at the progress that we're making as a city. So more of those to come. Uh, we have three more closings that are planned for the first quarter of 2022. These are all deals that you approved last year. I mentioned earlier that there's some issues that we're helping these projects work through because of the increasing con uh, construction costs, insurance costs, and just the overall volatility in the markets in the world today. Just is something that we'll have to work through for these remaining closings and the other projects that we have in the pipeline that we'd like to close in the second, third, and fourth quarters of this year. Um, so the majority of, uh, our, of our active applications are currently pilots, payments and little taxes. Um, and there's a reason for that, number one, LHC has been putting out funding uh, and that generally requires the developer to issue their bonds through LAC. However, we know that many other developers uh, are starting to look at us for the issuance of their bonds. And, and then we're also preparing to have the internal infrastructure, the internal credit worthiness and, and capacity in order to support those bond issues. So it's one thing for us to uh, do a conduit issuance and it's a pass through. Maybe the developer has an investor lined up already, but it's a completely different approach for us to actually use our balance sheet, put some of our credit at risk in order to stimulate the issuance of more bonds through finance New Orleans. So that is in the plans. As you know, we've been actively seeking out ways to raise capital that will help us create this $1 billion impact. We've been looking at a variety of tools, including the National Green Bank, uh, we've been studying the issuance of impact bonds for the last few years, and we'll be coming forth with some updates on our fundraising efforts because we feel it's time to start scaling up our programs. We have them set up. We know we can close the deal from A to Z. Now we want to get uh, our balance sheet with more capacity so that we can support more of these projects and have um, a bigger creation of community impact and more, <clears throat> excuse me, more community wealth that flows back through Finance New Orleans so that we can reinvest it in newer projects and keep the innovation cycle moving. So you'll hear more about our, fun, our fundraising needs in uh, upcoming board meetings, but otherwise most of our time is gonna be spent lifting these projects off the ground. Next slide, Naj. I won't spend too much time on these. These are uh, just the stats on, on what I just talked about. Next slide. Next slide. You can just go all the way to the, the pipeline, which I believe is two more slides down. Um, I know this is hard to see on this screen. You have it in your, your, um, your packages, but these are the 17 projects that we're actively uh, helping to get, on, get beyond the finish line. You see that there's some uh, pilot deals, some pilots and bonds, different mix of projects, and they're in different phases. So we're going to continue to work and provide technical assistance to the developer teams, to the consultants, and the legal teams that we often work with in order to move these projects forward. Uh, but this is a snapshot, and we're going to be cleansing the pipeline, that larger pipeline of those 52 deals. We think a lot of those are possible, but we're going to be digging deeper into it to understand what the, the, the annual pipeline looks like. How many deals should we be doing on an annual basis? 
um, and how much balance sheet capacity will that require. So that study is happening right now in the background and we'll come forth with more information. Are there any questions about the program's report this month? Thank you, we can move on. Yep, thank you so much, guys. Elizabeth, will you please move the developers over? Thank you. Um, we are getting ready to hear from Mr. Ryan Herringshaw. Yes, hi, good afternoon hi. and thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, Ryan. Ab absolutely, hey, Damon. Um, well, Damon, a big thank you to you, your team, and also this committee for having us here today. We're, we're excited to be having our first project move through this process at the Finance Authority in New Orleans. Um, so my name is Ryan Hearingshaw. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Director of Real Estate Development for Providence Community Housing. Uh, we're here today talking about the Our Lady of Lords project. Uh, it's 62 affordable senior apartments uh, located at the corner of Ferret Street and Napoleon Avenue in Uptown New Orleans. Uh, this project was most recently in service as Holy Rosary Academy um, for the Archdiocese in New Orleans until the spring of 2019. When it was closed, the parish then invited Providence in along with a couple other partners to facilitate the redevelopment and make sure that this building remained a community asset. So a huge thank you to them. Um, without the support that we've gotten, this project wouldn't really be possible. Um, they are providing this at an incredible below market acquisition rate. Um, so if you could, uh, I think I have to ask you to go to the next slide as well. Um, so just a little bit of background on Providence. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based here in New Orleans, um, looking at affordable housing. We both produce and preserve existing affordable housing. We're also looking at empowerment opportunities. So you'll see this kind of theme through this presentation of how the development itself is programmed to empower residents and how we're looking at also connecting to services and opportunities that enhance our residents' lives. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just an overview of this project, as I mentioned, it's 62 affordable senior apartments, 21 of these are studio units and 41 of these are one bedroom units. Uh, it is 100% affordable with six units reserved for families making at or below extremely low income for 30% AMI and the remainder of that at 50% AMI. Uh, this will have at least a 45 year affordability period as a waiver of qualified contract rights through the tax credit program. Uh, we expect that that'll actually be closer to 50 or 60 years based on some other funding that we'll be receiving through the city of New Orleans. Uh, as I mentioned also, it is an adaptive reuse of a historic school structure. Uh, this was originally placed in service in 1957 as a mid-century modern building. Um, and we're proposing here to reuse that existing building and its footprint, as well as a small new addition portion to make sure that it is feasible at a scale uh, to support itself long term into the future. Uh, we've got a great development team put together here. I won't read them all out loud, um, but, but very happy to be working with these folks. Uh, and of course, a, another shout out to the, uh, the Finance Authority of New Orleans. This project was originally a 9% tax credit submission in 2020. Uh, the state had other priorities at that time. We did not see any allocations come to New Orleans. So we were able to reconfigure this to be a 4% low income housing tax credit project that utilizes state and federal historic credits, as well as the pilot through the Finance Authority of New Orleans. If you can go to the next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, we'll talk a lot about kind of resident and community benefits. Uh, part of the program here and what we're doing is making sure that we're not just creating a place where people can live, but also a place that offers those benefits that are not common in a lot of affordable housing that's been built to date. Um, so you can see here that we'll actually be keeping the majority of the gym and auditorium space within this building. Not only will that be as a primary use to the tenants for their congregational activities, but also available to the community at large as a community facility. So we anticipate having things like the Ferret Neighborhood Association hosting their monthly meetings, other outreach items, and also offers us a, a tremendous amount of flexible space 
where we can bring in outside programming, whether that's medical services or other kind of engagement activities and bring them there for those residents. Uh, we'll also have a business center on the campus with computers and printers and internet access. The campus itself is, uh, is fully secure and gated, um, noting that security continues to be an increasing uh, concern in New Orleans, especially for vulnerable and, and senior tenancy. Um, a full development Wi-Fi, uh, especially after the events of Hurricane Ida, we're noting exactly how important resiliency and kind of islandable operations are. Uh, so this project will include a natural gas generator that will power all of the common areas, a cooling unit within that gymnasium, as well as all of the security and other access control features on the property to make sure that if we're in that extended power outage scenario again, um, that residents aren't seeking other sheltered areas that they can shelter in place. Uh, and of course, this project will also offer some off-street parking in the parking lot that you can see in the picture here. Um, one of the items that Providence is really proud of over the last 10 or 15 years as we've built housing, we've had great partnerships to bring services in. We realized pretty early on that we're not good at providing services ourselves. We're good at developing housing, um, but it takes a tremendous amount of effort to find the money to pay for those services long term. So we've now switched to a model where we're capitalizing and escrowing a reserve up front to ensure that we can bring those services long term with those different qualified partners that are in the city. Uh, as part of our climate resilience plan, obviously, we'll be meeting the city of New Orleans stormwater retention policy requirements, as well as this property will be Enterprise Green Communities 2020 certified. Uh, so not only does that uh, help us in making sure that we're being sustainable in our material and building choices, but it'll off also offer kind of material benefits to our tenants who are then paying for their water and uh I'm sorry, not their water and sewer bills, those are on the house, but their electric bills, right? So it, it keeps those bills lower as we've included this efficient equipment. Uh, as far as job creation, we estimate that we'll have about 151 construction jobs. We'll also have at least two permanent jobs. That does not include contract services or anything of that nature. Uh, we have a DBE contracting goal at 35% of the total development cost. Uh, we will also be subject to Davis-Bacon wages uh, under the LA-1 residential schedule. And we also have a Section 3 hiring and training component for any contract over $100,000 on this potential job. Um, so, and then best of all, at the very end here is just access, right? Um, to be on the mouth of the Ferret Street corridor is a really tremendous opportunity and a location for affordable housing to be, uh, especially for those seniors that are being extensively placed and displaced out of this neighborhood. So it's a, it's a wonderful place with all of the other investment that's happening there. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just a quick overview on the financing. Um, this project is a HUD 221-D4 loan. Um, we're expecting to merge that together with the state historic credits and the federal historic credits as well. Uh, and of course, the 4% LIHTC equity. Uh, we have applied for a $1.5 million for the federal funding from the city of New Orleans, as well as we have our own developer contributions in the form of equity and deferred fee. Um, and then a very simple uh, uses budget here. As I mentioned, uh, Blessed Trinity Parish is providing this at a significant undervalue acquisition. Uh, and of course, hard cost and other pieces here. Um, the one thing I think that is notable, um, if anybody was keeping track of the uh, Federal Reserve meeting today, it was announced that there's a, a quarter percent rate increase that's coming out of this meeting and they're expecting to raise rates at all six meetings through the rest of the year, uh, potentially as much as a percent and a half. Uh, so that's gonna be a, a really significant variance in how I think all projects are being underwritten. Uh, it's something that we are uh, certainly acutely aware of as we're looking to lock in our financing rates. Uh, we do have some cushion to help us absorb those things, but you know, I, I think uh, I speak on behalf of the entire development community when it really signifies how important programs like pilots are to make sure that we still have the necessary financing to go out and get things like this done. Um, so if we can go through the next slide and then I'll, I'll go through these kind of pretty quickly because these are more about the kind of historic background of this facility itself. Um, and you can actually go ahead and go right down to the next one as well. Just seeing how this site has been built out over the last hundred or so years into what we have today. 
Um, and and our, our development team and, and architecture team in particular has been pretty fantastic in working with us to make sure that we are preserving those community elements. Um, so obviously this building won't get torn down and torn into a, a strip mall or, or some other kind of crazy high rise structure that uh, may be allowable under zoning components. And we've really been able to lean into those mid-century modern uh, developments here. So if we go to the next slide, um, just very quickly, we'll see some of the original plans from this building in 1957, just laying out that kind of classroom and cafeteria and gymnasium. Uh, and, and we're really happy to be able to preserve so many of those great elements within here. Um, we have some photos from the 1957s. If you go to the next slide, Could I, could I go to the next slide, please? Oh, there it is. Um, so just some of the exterior conditions. Um, one of the great things about using historic tax credits is that we'll be able to retain all of those uh, wonderful historic features, both outside and in. Um, you can see we've, we've got, again, uh, kudos to the design team and being able to bring in some really modern technology in this full kind of interior three-dimensional scan. Um, very helpful in coordinating with the National Park Service and, and other affiliated folks. Uh, and we can probably go ahead and skip uh, skip the next slide. So if we could go two slides in advance. Um, here is just kind of a, an indication of what some of the interiors of these classrooms look like and how we're able to keep these different features. Uh, each one of these units will keep some of the built-in lockers um, that are in each one of these classrooms. All of the historic glass block over the window, of course, the window units are removed. They'll get modern. Uh, central air conditioning and other things of that nature. All of the flooring will be replaced with modern efficient flooring um, that mimics actually some of the pattern tiles that are there from the 50s as well. Um, but most importantly, if we go to the next slide where we have a slightly enlarged floor plan, um, you can see the layout of these units and how we're ensuring that not only are we you know, making a unit out of a classroom here, uh, but we're trying to make sure that this is more than just right four walls with a roof. Um, so each one of these units will have their own independent control of thermostat, hot water heater, et cetera, but also a washer dryer inside of each unit. They don't have to go to the washateria down the street. They don't have to go to a coin operated machine on the third floor and drag their, uh, you know, their laundry and everything around with them. Um, and just really providing a clean and efficient layout for folks, as well as having that walk-in closet in each one of these rooms. So really making sure that we're making the most of this space to create a comfortable living space for the seniors that'll one day call this home. Uh, and then the, uh, the last slide after this one here, I think is, is particularly interesting as well. Um, if we could go just one more, uh, these kind of show a cross section of what that gym space will turn into, right? And so this is a, a real tremendous opportunity for us to make sure something that is a facet of the community now is continued forward as community use in the future. So being able to keep an entire wing of those bleachers for maybe large scale presentations or other kind of community gathering events, maybe this is a food or a toy distribution uh, during the holidays, having all of those tables for breakout sessions and community information. Um, and as well as you can see how that plays into the other spaces that we're building out. Whereas you go up onto that balcony, that is where you have the business center and a seating area that seniors can then enjoy that kind of double height space with those big clear story windows. Um, so we're, we're just really excited about how this project is working out and being able to retain some of these unique spaces and, and their service to the community. Uh, and I think um, that will be the end of this presentation. Um, Damon, I'm not sure if, uh, if I go right into questioning or if, if you folks need to, to kick me out to talk about other things, but I'll, I'll follow your lead. Thank you for the presentation, Ryan. We can uh, take more questions at this moment, if there are any. Um, I see you all have a 35% a uh, DBE goal on the project. Uh, great presentation, by the way, first of all. Thank you. Um, um, I see you have a 35% um, a DBE goal on the project. And I'm uh, wondering if that, um, um, if you've identified um, 
at DBE to work on the project? And then um, is there a monitoring mechanism to ensure that you all meet that 35% goal? Both great questions. Um, so at the moment, we've gone through an exercise where we have done one public bid to bring in general contractors and make sure that we have a pricing estimation. Uh, we're actually in the next probably three to four months here as we go through our HUD firm application process in the background, we'll launch a larger scale community initiative. Um, so Landis Construction is our chosen general contractor. They're fully aware of all of our hiring and contracting targets, but actually out at the site, we'll be able to have some large table discussion. We'll have a job fair, a contractor fair. We'll be working with the Ferret Neighborhood Association, actually hitting the pavement, flyering out you know, multiple blocks around the site, ensuring that people are, are aware that there are opportunities here. In addition to that, uh, on Providence's website, we have a contractor sign-up form that we keep a running list. Uh, we provide that over to each of our general contractors to ensure that anybody who's signed up as an interest to work in any field whatsoever will get the invitation to bid on whatever their trade or scope might be. Uh, and the second part of that question in relation to making sure that we're actually doing what we say that we're doing, um, there's, a, there's a multiple part component there. Um, the first of which is this project will have project-based vouchers from uh, the Housing Authority of New Orleans. So that brings with it its own reporting requirement. They usually go up to the city and will rely on them as the responsible entity. And so that one and a half million dollars of federal funding that we've applied for from the city will be reporting on their DDE systems and forms as well as through their labor compliance group. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Johnson Banks. Uh, I had a couple questions, Ryan. How you doing? Um, I'm um, doing well. I'm sorry you had to sit through this presentation twice. <laughs> I know I've seen this before, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. Uh, I did have one question that I the last that, that it triggered the last time I saw it, and we weren't in a place where I could ask it of you. So I'm going to ask you now. Do y'all have your A half signed for your PBBs? We do not yet have the AHAP sign. That's the okay. that's probably the longest lead process that we're working through with Hanno right now. Um, okay. We, yeah, we've been in long term discussions with them to make sure that this project can go forward. Yeah, because I know, um, you know, they 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 have a they're, they're getting they're getting close to their their limit their cap, um, and they've got to hold some back for uh, to finish Iberville. And um, and so just if you can make sure that you guys do that, because um, I know we had a deal that kind of changed on us um, that uh, didn't have when he got down to it, it didn't have any um, PVVs in it. And they thought they might be able to get some, but it was a much larger project. So hopefully uh, you all um, will be able to get them. And you're going to is it going to be 100 percent PVVs or? That's the expectation right now. Um, if if that were to change. Not that many. Yeah. It, that's right. Yeah, it's it's not nearly as many as some of our other projects could be. Um, mm -hmm. But if that were to change, we would also probably approach the Louisiana Housing Corporation. Uh, they're having a real hard time placing their permanent supportive housing vouchers. Um, and and yeah, so those are those are much needed and they to, want the yeah. one bedrooms. Yeah, that's yeah, that that would be a good, good um, alternative um, as, as a backup. And again, like you said, this is, that's where the needs are, the one bedroom. So Absolutely. that was that was my only question, because um, that could impact um, not any other thing that does with our approval, but the timeline. And um, we talked a little bit about construction costs. Um, you guys, where are you guys, have you guys gotten insurance estimates yet? Um, yeah, no, all, all terrifying things across the industry right now. So that's, um, that's part of where we're at. As I mentioned, we did the original, uh, original pricing exercise and we'll be doing the kind of full and final pricing exercise that's designed to get us that market pricing with all of the sub and DBE input that hopefully will be within about 90 days of closing. So we should be able to start buying out contracts and move from there. Uh, on the insurance side of things, um, you know, obviously we've, we've got a close ear to that on the ground as well. Um, right. we've, we've used the same calculator that we got um, for our other properties in our policy right now. And we've applied a 35% increase year over year. Wow. Um, the biggest, yeah, it's, it's terrifying because that's really yep. what's out there right now. Um, and the, the biggest thing that we're worried about, you know, just 
to be fully transparent is not so much that that isn't the price of insurance. It's that with multiple players pulling out of the market, Mm -hmm. the remaining players here may not be willing to sign on new pieces, which means that we'll have to go for one-offs instead of just adding to a larger policy. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully, you know, if we have to go that route, obviously we will, uh, we've got our entire asset management team kind of involved in that right now, because we're starting our own renewal process that happens in May. Um, but if we have to go for a one-off, we'll go for a one-off. Hopefully that would get us past the point of where, you know, the market has settled and found where it's going to be. And people are accepting new things back onto their plans again. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for the good questions. And it was just Giselle and I here today, so um, we're the only two board members who could ask questions. Uh, so let's go ahead and- Oh, Steve is here. Steve is oh, here. Steve. Hey, Steve, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Steve, do you have any questions? I do not, no problem. Okay, thank you so much. So Damon, um, so we've got the project summary. We've done everything. Yeah, every, everything is about, I'm looking at the agenda. We just got it broken down. Um, I think Ryan's taking us, we've, we've gone through the project summary. You want to take us, we're going to have, um, or do you want to go over the project summary and then have Wayne take us through all of this in the in the reviews? No, I, actually, I think we can jump right into Wayne's part of Wayne's it. President. So, okay, that's, that's what I thought. Um, I, I think I saw Wayne, and I know I saw him in the waiting room. <laughs> I assume he's been promoted, so he can he can start on his presentation. I mean, hopefully it's not a whole presentation; it's just an overview. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Now we can. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, this resolution is the first step in the bond financing that will. Uh, authorize uh, up to $13 million of multifamily housing revenue bonds for, for the uh, Our Lady of Lords project. And uh, it authorizes us to uh, give the notice of intention uh, and uh, to, to issue these bonds in accordance with the Public Trust Act, where we'll issue this uh, public notice and, and, uh, and publish it four times over the course of uh, uh, a, a period that requires one publication uh, each week, uh, following which uh, we will schedule or arrange to have the board meet in, in an open and public uh, meeting to conduct a public hearing in, the, in accordance with the Public Trust Act to uh, receive any uh, public comment and our objections to the project. It's a, a, it's a feature of the Public Trust Act that if, uh, the, pub, if the finance authority receives a petition signed by uh, 10% of the voters of the city objecting to the project, then uh, there must be an election call to uh, approve the project. Uh, we have never seen that provision of the uh, Public Trust ever use. So uh, it's just a formality of, of how we satisfy the public trust law in uh, noticing the public that that opportunity exists for uh, a petition to be filed to object to the project. Simultaneously with the uh, public hearing conducted by uh, the board of, of FANO, we would expect uh, another hearing in accordance with the Public Trust Act, which essentially is uh, to uh, receive public comments, but does not require any uh, formal action on the part of the board or its staff. It's simply a formality of conducting that hearing and then uh, providing a copy of the minutes of that hearing in a format to be delivered to uh, the ele- applicable elected representative of the finance authority, which uh, could either be the mayor or the uh, city council. So uh, we would expect that that uh, public meeting uh, proceeding be submitted to the mayor for the mayor's approval. That's simply a requirement of issuing the tax exempt bonds in accord with the, with the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Code. So at this point, this is the first step. Uh, we're working with uh, staff to uh, uh, 
anticipate when we could uh, submit the uh, uh, application to the bond commission because uh, part of the protocol for issuing tax exempt bonds or any bonds by public trust in the state of Louisiana is that the bond commission approved those bonds. Uh, there is a, uh, an application that we will uh, prepare and circulate to the development team and to, to, to the staff of the finance authority uh, that evidences uh, a number of details uh, with respect to the bonds in terms of the uh, maximum maturity, maximum interest rate, and the uh, maximum uh, principal amount of the bonds. And uh, there are uh, 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 details relating to the cost of issuance that a state statute requires that we complete and submit to the bond commission. Currently, that state statute uh, provides that uh, uh, any costs not approved by the bond commission uh, uh, cannot be paid uh, at closing uh, without a supplemental approval by the bond commission. There is a, an amendment to that statute in place to delete that requirement of the bond commission having to approve any costs that uh, go beyond that, which has been approved by the bond commission. So hopefully by the time uh, we're uh, getting toward the closing table, that statute would have passed and uh, eliminate that requirement. So to sum it up and to, to make a long story short, this is the first step. We have a number of steps between now and getting to the closing table. Uh, obviously, uh, for purposes of, of how we uh, close this particular tax and bond issue, there's a need for the Louisiana Housing Corporation and the Finance Authority to coordinate, primarily because uh, as the Finance Authority is issuing the bonds, it has to uh, deliver up, uh, in connection with the bonds, a, a, a 42M letter that references how it underwrote the bonds. And uh, likewise, uh, the housing credit agency, which is the Louisiana Housing Corporation, will have to issue a 42M letter that specifies uh, how uh, the project satisfies the qualified allocation plan and how many credits have been determined as needed for the project to be feasible and viable over the 10 year credit period. So there are a lot of, lot of details involving uh, this type of financing. And uh, uh, this is going to be the second project that will uh, go through the finance authority where the, uh, the bonds are issued by the finance authority, but the credit underwriting is coordinated between uh, the finance authority and LHC. And it seems like the staff has done a pretty good job, uh, better than a pretty good job at coordinating with LHC as to uh, how that underwriting of these projects get complete. So. With that, uh, we would simply uh, suggest that this particular resolution be reported out of the out of the uh, uh, the committee to the full board for adoption. It's next meeting on March twenty eighth. If there's any question, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So yeah, when you may not be aware of our, our process, um, we don't we give ourselves a full month of review before the full board approved. So it's been introduced at this meeting, which means we can report to the full board that it has been um, reviewed by the programs committee um, and that we will expect them to um, take it up at the April meeting. Okay. Um, th that's fine. Uh, th that's something that uh, I'm looking at the resolution we were coordinating with staff. We, we, uh, we're, we thought that the the, the March meeting was uh, uh, was okay, but if it's deferred till April, that's that's uh, that that's up to uh, uh, the committee to uh, recommend that the April board meeting be the target date for uh, approving this preliminary resolution. Great. Um, do the other um, commissioners have any? Um, the other board members have any questions, comments? I don't have anything. All right, so um, I do think we, uh, so do we wanna act on these together, um, Iatra, uh or and Damon, or do we wanna take them in one at a time? Well, we got the approval 
of the pilot res I mean, yeah, we talked about uh, we got the inducement bond resolution and the pilot uh, uh, pilot resolution. So we just want to take them together. Or I mean, really, we want to review them now, giving everybody a chance to go through them, and then um, I think we should probably act in April as well. Other board members, what do you think? That makes sense to me. I'm, I'm okay with um, I'm moving to April. Okay, okay great. So um, so we're not gonna vote on it today because we, we need to, at one, we need to make a few changes to it anyway so that it's clear that it's going in April. But we are glad that we're following our pro process um, to give the board the, all the time necessary to review these documents in full, give us a chance to ask questions and, and, and things like that, which is great, and um, get some really exciting projects moving. So this is, uh, this, the staff is to be commended for bringing us yet another um, great deal that is going to help, you know, uh, that is going to honor all the commitments that y'all have made uh, around getting this pipeline moving. So we're really, really excited. Thank you. All right, um, I think that's it for the for our business. Um, do we have any public comments? No public comments at this time. All right, well, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I covered everything on motion to adjourn. I got one from Steve is seconded by the bell. That's what yeah. you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I was trying to come off me. Okay. I got you. That's all right. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Uh, all right. Mo meeting is adjourned. Thank y'all so much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye. Y'all take care.